I'd like to thank uh, both the people in the room for coming tonight um, and for uh, tuning in on uh, Monday night and avoiding Monday night football. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about advanced uh, treatments for hip and knee pain. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Blackwood, and like they said, I'm at the Boulder Center for Orthopedics uh, here in Boulder. A little bit about myself, I grew up in Montana, uh, attended a small uh, undergrad college, Carroll College in Helena, Montana. Proceeded on to medical school at the University of Washington out in Seattle, and then did a residency in orthopedic surgery at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. My fellowship in joint replacement was done at the Kuhn Joint Replacement Institute in St. Helena, California. Um, I actually stayed on there uh, and started my practice uh, before moving to uh, Boulder. Um, St. Helena, like Boulder, uh, was actually hit uh, very recently with a very bad uh, fire um, and uh, the hospital managed to be spared but the area around there was, was significantly burned and so I, I do wish the best for, for my friends uh, back uh, in St. Helena and hope that they uh, recover quickly. Uh, during that time uh, at my fellowship, I was the first surgeon in the country or in the world uh, with fellowship level training, specifically in robotic assisted joint replacement. I have uh, medical licenses in uh, Colorado and Montana, um, and I am a, a consultant uh, for Stryker Robotics, uh, which means I'm an educational consultant who goes around the country uh, or has uh, doctors come to us here in Boulder to observe surgeries. Uh, we educate them on the benefits of robotics and how to use the, uh, the system uh, safely uh, to give great outcomes for their patients. A little bit about me here and my roots in Boulder County. Uh, this gentleman that's taller than me here is my grandfather who lived up in Longmont, uh, just up the road uh, for 50 plus years. I used to come down in the summers uh, and help on the farm, uh, throw uh, hay, hay bales uh, and actually showed cattle. Uh, and uh, 30 years ago uh, this summer, um, I won a blue ribbon in the uh, Boulder County Fair for that uh, heifer. So that's my, my first big claim to fame. Um, and then I uh, was actually on the front page of the Daily Camera, uh, sorry, in the uh, Times Call up in Longmont, riding on the back of those hay bales on that hay trailer. So uh, that field is now full of uh, uh, development um, that has built up in front of my grandfather's old dental office. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see how much changes in 30 years. Things also change and everyone uh, wants updated pictures of what the family and kids look like, uh, most especially the twins. So uh, they actually turned uh, 18 months uh, this last weekend. Uh, the five children that, that keep us busy and, and on our toes and everyone wants to see updated pictures of them. And here's the uh, whole family uh, out on a lake, uh, sort of enjoying ourselves. What you may not notice in the bottom right hand corner is my brother-in-law's foot uh, holding that inner tube in place. This is where attention to detail comes in in many areas of life. Um, once he removed that foot after taking this picture, we all flipped over backwards into the lake, um, which was quite an exciting uh, experience for everyone. Uh, everyone's fine, everyone's wearing life jackets, but uh, it's the little things that you want to pay attention to uh, in life in many, many areas. More about my practice. Uh, my joint replacement practice is focused on minimally invasive surgical techniques uh, combined with advanced technology. We're able to do 99 plus percent of our cases under a spinal anesthetic, so you don't have to have a tube down your throat or have general anesthesia. Our average length of stay for both hips and knee replacements is one day, and we're actually getting more and more patients going home the same day. Uh, 90 plus percent of patients are able to be discharged directly to home with just outpatient physical therapy. Uh, so they don't have to have home health, they don't have to go to a skilled nursing facility, uh, they don't have to go to a, uh, a rehab facility. So they can recover in the comfort of their own home. And we're doing more and more cases at the uh, outpatient surgery center uh, so patients can avoid the hospital uh, completely uh, and we can re, uh, conserve resources uh, as we are in the middle of a, a pandemic at this time. Um, although Boulder has been uh, handling it very well uh, compared to other areas of the country. Uh, we at Boulder Center for Orthopedics have the lowest complication rate in joint replacements in Boulder. Um, that is practice-wide uh, in comparison of practices. Uh, we have pride ourselves at Boulder Center for Orthopedics for excellent outcomes and excellent patient care. Um, and so whether it's myself or some of my partners, uh, you are in good hands if you trust us uh, with your medical care and treatment for hip and knee pain. Just kind of want to start at the beginning of what is the main cause for hip and knee pain at this time. Uh, as patients get older, the most common is arthritis. Well, what is arthritis? Uh, arthritis is an inflamed joint. Um, you can see there on the left-hand side of your screen that uh, knee joint, there's nice smooth white cartilage. It's like the end of the chicken bone. Uh, cartilage is a very smooth surface. Uh, there's no pain fibers in cartilage. It's excellent for joints and gliding and sliding between surfaces. As that cartilage starts to degrade or wear away, it exposes the bone underneath, and you can see that on the picture on the right-hand side. 
that bone has a lot of pain fibers in there, causes a lot of irritation and inflammation, and that's what causes a lot of the pain and discomfort as that cartilage wears away. Two main types of arthritis is osteoarthritis is by far the most common. This is when that articular cartilage starts to wear out, when that smooth gliding surface is replaced uh, and the bone underneath is exposed. Um, this can be post-traumatic, it can be post-surgical, it can just be from wear and tear, uh, genetics. There's many different causes uh, for osteoarthritis and often we don't understand or we cannot pinpoint exactly what the reason is why that joint wore out. The second category is inflammatory arthritis. This is more of a systemic process, such as rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. This is when the body actually turns against itself and starts to attack the normal uh, tissue. Uh, there's a lot of good medications that patients have for these, and so we're seeing fewer and fewer patients who need to have their joints replaced if they can get on top of their rheumatoid arthritis, although we still do have patients from time to time uh, who still need to have arthritis, and you can have both osteoarthritis and, rheumat and inflammatory arthritis. Uh, so once that cartilage is gone, you are sort of left with more uh, uh, advanced treatments or uh, invasive treatments. This is what that looks like on x-ray. So the knee on the left-hand side of the screen is very worn out. There's no space between the bones. Uh, as you can see, compared to the knee on the other side where there's space between those bones. This is where we get that term bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. Uh, so the knee on the right does have cartilage in between those bones, and that's what's keeping them apart. Whereas the knee on the left has uh, worn that cartilage out and exposed that bone underneath. You can see it's developed a lot of bone spurs and deformity around there. There's even some cysts uh, in the bone as well, uh, which is where some fluid leaks into the bone and, and causes some weakness. When the bone is that worn out, it's very easy to tell, but you can also have arthritis that's less dramatic. So it can be isolated to single compartments of the knee on one side or the other. Um, it doesn't have to affect the entire knee joint. Hips is very similar, so a ball and socket joint, uh, very smooth and gliding, allows for good range of motion and stability. Um, as that hip starts to wear out, it does become uh, harder to move, and often patients will notice a decreased range of motion before they will notice pain. So some patients have had stiff hips for years um, before they actually start to have pain as that cartilage starts to degrade and expose that bone underneath. Again, this is what that looks like on x-ray. The hip on the right-hand side of the screen has good space between the, the ball and the cup, whereas on the left-hand side of the screen, the hip has completely worn out, developed big bone spurs, bone on bone, and you can see it actually deforms the femoral head. That ball starts to become from circular into very oblong or egg-shaped or even mushroom-shaped. There are other causes of hip pain that may not be arthritis-related. There can be bursitis, which is lateral-sided pain. It can be worse when you lay on that side. It can be worse going up and down stairs. It actually can hurt to lay on the other side, but that pain is more on the outside portion of the hip. Back pain can radiate down and cause hip pain or back pain symptoms, uh, and patients can have hernias that can cause pain in the groin, which mimics the pain in the groin from hip arthritis. Um, so sometimes you can have different things that, you know, we'll have patients that come to see us for hip pain and it turns out they need to go to see our spine doctor. Um, they swear they need a hip replacement, which really bursitis, it can be treated with anti-inflammatories, injections, and physical therapy, or a hernia where we actually send patients uh, to the general surgeons to get that fixed. So we do have to try to, you know, do a little bit more diagnostic um, evaluation when we evaluate hips and try to figure out exactly what's causing that pain. In general, the number of people needing uh, hip and knee replacements and having hip and knee arthritis is uh, projected to grow rapidly. Um, this study is from a few years ago, uh, showing the projection of increase uh, from about five to 600,000 knee and hip replacements done per year, up to 3.5 million. Um, we're definitely seeing that happen with baby boomers and patients living longer, patients wearing out their joints sooner, um, and the need for hip and knee replacement is dramatically uh, increasing uh, throughout time. It's a new generation of patients. Uh, patients are getting better, educa better educated. They're both younger and older. Uh, we've had patients in their teens that unfortunately have had their hips wear out. Um, we have patients in their 90s and even into 100 uh, that can, you know, had, need to have their joints replaced. Um, these patients have different expectations. Uh, we live in this area, which was uh, recently named number one in U.S. News and World Report for a reason. We want to maintain that quality of life and have active lifestyles. And so patients don't want to be told, here's your cane, here's your walker, um, don't go and hike on that mountain today. Um, they want to be able to get back into those activities that they enjoy uh, that makes them have a high quality of life. 
patients are better informed today. Uh, they're listening to lectures like this uh, on the internet. Um, the internet allows lots of access to information. Um, you can get information about your surgeon, you can get information about the hospital, uh, information of different treatment options, uh, but also be aware of the internet uh, and most especially stem cells. Uh, there's no quality control on the internet. Um, usually when I say that, there's people in the room and you're not watching me on the internet, uh, but anybody can put anything they want on there and there's really no um, fact checking or uh, quality control uh, that goes on what they say and so uh, just be careful um, take uh, things that sound too good to be true often are um, and so just try to do as much research as you can uh, to be informed about these processes and procedures most important question that we get is how can I avoid or delay a joint replacement? Um, our goal is to make your hip or knee feel better uh, with as minimally invasive uh, options as we can. Um, so we often start with just rest or ice or heat applications. Uh, medications for inflammation and pain can be very effective. Uh, Over-the-counter medications um, can be very effective for uh, a number of years or in the short term. Lifestyle modification can be important, so avoiding high impact activities, uh, things that are very difficult or hard on the joints, you wanna to try to avoid those. Uh, physical therapy can be helpful for maintaining the range of motion and strength around the joint, um, although it may not uh, slow the process of the degradation of the joint. Joint fluid supplements or injections uh, are often a good option to try to prolong the life of that joint. Knee arthroscopy and hip arthroscopy has kind of fallen out of favor as a, as a treatment for arthritis. Um, so those are things that you may want to try to avoid uh, for treatment of uh, hip and knee pain. Unless you have an acute uh, loose body or an acute meniscus tear, often you know, we do no longer go in and just try to clean it up and buy some time. Uh, we actually found that that's not very effective uh, for treatment of, of knee arthritis. And then total joint replacement, which we'll talk about more specifically. This is sort of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons guidelines um, that you can see here is sort of recommendations for management of knee arthritis and it's very similar for hip arthritis. Um, most importantly is weight loss. So if you keep the, the weight off of the joint, it helps it to prolong and, and take some pain away from that. Uh, exercise and physical therapy, we want you to be active. We want you to use these joints. Uh, continued activity, uh, biking, swimming, those sorts of activities are very good. Um, Over-the-counter anti-inflammatory medications, uh, it's very surprising how many people come into the office and they don't want to take uh, any anti-inflammatories at all. Obviously, you don't want to take a lot for a long period of time, um, but low doses are, are very safe uh, in most patients. Um, well, you may want to talk with your doctor if you are on a blood thinner uh, or have issues with stomach uh, intolerance for anti-inflammatories or have any kidney or liver issues. Um, we try to avoid opioids uh, in arthritis pain. It doesn't seem to be very effective and actually makes it more difficult uh, to control pain after the surgery. Uh, and then interarticular injections, we'll talk about more uh, extensively in a minute. Um, there actually isn't great uh, evidence supporting these uh, interarticular injections. Um, they actually recommend against using hyaluronic acid or the uh, gel injections. Um, and it's sort of equivocal for uh, corticosteroid injections, uh, platelet-rich plasma injections. Uh, we haven't come up with great studies. These are definitely not going to cure what's going on in the joint, uh, but they may help to alleviate symptoms for a period of time. And that's what our goal is at that point. So again, kind of starting off with this rest or ice, over-the-counter medications are a great place to start. Ibuprofen, Aleve, Tylenol, uh, prescription medications like Celebrex. Sometimes Celebrex can be used in the setting of blood thinners for a short period of time uh, if patients are on chronic uh, anticoagulants. Topical compounds can be uh, effective. Um, Voltaren gel has just become over-the-counter, um, and that can be a very effective just to rub onto the joint, um, and that way you can help to avoid some of the stomach complications from some of these anti-inflammatories. Glucosamine and chondroitin uh, was a big push for this a few years ago. Um, there isn't any big large-scale studies that support uh, benefit uh, in a large number of patients, um, but I do have patients who swear by it on an individual basis. Um, so if you have curious about this, uh, you may stop it for a little while if you're taking it, see if you notice a difference. Um, if you're not, then it's probably not worth the, the cost for the medications. Activity modification is a big one, so avoiding those high impact activities like running and jumping. Um, not overly popular in Boulder for telling people not to run, uh, but we do encourage biking. Uh, that's very good for the joints and both the hips and the knees. And then we want uh, weight loss. We want our body mass index or BMI to be lower than 40. Uh, that helps take pressure off the joint. Uh, the joint carries five to seven times your body weight going up and down stairs or kind of moving around. So every pound that you lose is five to seven pounds off the, the joint. Um, so if you lose 10 pounds, that's 50 to 
to 70 pounds off that joint and that can really help to alleviate and offset some of the, the pain and discomfort that you have in those uh, joints. So also as we proceed to surgery, uh, the BMI is a cutoff where we see an increased risk of complications. So there's increased risk of blood clots, pneumonias, uh, wound healing complications, infections. Um, and so we want to try to you know, get that weight down if we can for both the long-term life of your native joint uh, and for success in surgery if we do have to replace that joint. Joint injections is sort of the first line uh, invasive type procedure um, that we do. It is the office-based procedure that we can do in the clinic. Um, usually the most common is starting with cortisone. Uh, it's a single injection. Uh, it often works uh, for up to multiple months. Uh, it can be four to six months. It can also be weeks. Um, some people respond a little differently. Uh, there are some trepidation with cortisone. If you use too much too often, it can lead to degradation of the joint, uh, weakening of the bone and cartilage. So you want to use it judiciously. Um, I try to spread these out by about four months in between injections into the knees and four to six months in the injections in the hips, uh, just to try to make sure that we don't overwhelm that joint um, with the, the corticosteroid. Um, again, the short term um, can be symptomatic uh, relief for a period of time, uh, but it's not going to cure uh, the underlying process. Visco supplementation or chicken shots, this is the hyaluronic acid injections. It's covered by most insurances in knees, but not in hips, um, although there is starting to become less insurance coverage in the knee, replace, in the knee arthritis uh, category. Um, Kaiser uh, does not cover these um, anymore, um, and some insurance plans are starting to evaluate some of the data. Um, I try to reserve these for patients who have very minimal arthritis, but pain, and so if there's more cartilage in the knee, uh, the knee seems to respond better to these hyaluronic acid injections, um, or patients who aren't great candidates for surgery, or patients who really don't want, are not ready for surgery yet. Um, we try to do this to try to give them some pain relief. Um, if it is covered by our insurance, it's able to be repeated every six months. And it's either a series of shots once a week for three weeks um, or a single shot injection. Um, sometimes there is a little bit of a reaction with the single shot. And so we'll often do those in a series um, of once a week for three weeks. PRP or platelet-rich plasma. These are injections of concentrated blood products that we use to enhance the healing uh, in the joint. Um, it's not covered by insurance and can be relatively expensive in the five to $600 range. Um, there is some evidence showing that this is relatively equivocal to uh, corticosteroid injections. Um, and so there may be some benefit. Again, it is not going to cure what is going on. There are some evidence in soft tissue where platelet-rich plasma is very well uh, studied and has very good results um, in hamstring tears, uh, tennis elbow, uh, some rotator cuff information is coming out. But in joints, it's a little bit uh, less predictable. Um, so this is an option in lieu of surgery um, if you want to try that. Again, it is not going to cure the arthritis or make your cartilage uh, grow back. The promise of stem cells. So uh, this uh, patient zero for stem cells is down the road at Regenex. Um, and so it's a very good subject to cover in depth. And so we'll talk a little bit more than just one slide on these. The goal is to obtain stem cells, concentrate them, and inject them into the joint to decrease inflammation and promote healing. It's not covered by insurance and is very expensive in the five to $10,000 range, uh, 20,000 if you wanna to go to the Caymans for the, uh, the full experience. Uh, the people at uh, Regenix have said that my future as an orthopedic surgeon is going to be in the dustbin of history, uh, that I'm going to be brushed aside and not be useful to society anymore. Uh, so I wanted to look in a little bit further as to what the data is and evidence that they're using to support this. Um, they actually don't have a whole lot on their website. Um, this is from a few years ago. Um, they're comparing their outcomes for hip and knee injections uh, versus joint replacement. And so um, it's not a randomized controlled trial, um, but this is sort of the data they're using to encourage patients to proceed uh, with these bone marrow aspirate concentrate injections or the stem cell injections. Um, they compared this using the knee society score, um, which is out of 100. Um, so knee replacement patients were 48 out of 100 before they went through the procedure, whereas stem cell patients were uh, 69 out of 100. So the stem cell patients were markedly uh, better prior to uh, in procedure uh, and the uh, total knee replacement patients uh, improved up to uh, an 80, uh, while the stem cell patients uh, improved uh, to an 82. So significantly more improvement uh, from a worse starting point for the uh, total knee replacement patients as compared to the uh, bone marrow aspirate patients. 
This Harris hip score is similar to the knee score where it's out of 100. So uh, patients who had a total hip replacement had a score of 56 out of 100. Uh, they improved to 94 out of 100. Um, the patients who had stem cell injections or the bone marrow aspirate concentrate uh, started at, again, 69 um, and improved again 13 points uh, up to 82. Um, so significantly more improvement uh, with a hip replacement uh, than with the stem cell uh, injections. And this is data from the Regenex website supporting uh, stem cells. So um, as you can see here, hip replacement is markedly uh, better than stem cells, even from the uh, stem cell uh, community's own website. So uh, we're in the West, and in the West there was snake oil uh, back in the good old days. Um, and so I think uh, stem cells are getting similar to uh, the modern day snake oil. Um, snake oil actually worked um, in some instances, um, but it had nothing to do with the snake. Uh, there was capsaicin powder uh, in the uh, snake oil, um, and that helped to give some relief and pain relief, and we still use that today. Um, there may be some promise in stem cells and some portion of it similar to the capsaicin powder uh, that made the, the snake oil seem appealing. Um, um, but we need more research and more data to support and figure out what that is. Um, and so right now, it's, I can't uh, endorse that. And actually, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons um, does not endorse the use of uh, stem cells, uh, intra-articularly in joints. There are many uses for stem cells in medicine, so I'm not saying throw all the, the baby out with the pathwater. I'm just saying stem cells are not effective in joints for preventing arthritis. So um, if I was going to guess which of these was going to go in the dustbin of history as far as dealing with joint pain, I think that the stem cells is going to be found to not be as helpful um, as the promise that it holds um, and that I am going to continue to be able to be employed and support the five children that you saw earlier. But I understand surgery is a difficult choice. Uh, they actually did a study at Duke University in North Carolina, um, and 88% of the patients declined to proceed with joint replacement. Um, it's unknown if these patients then went back uh, from the tertiary referral center and had surgery at a, at a different facility, uh, but that's a lot of patients who declined uh, proceeding with the joint replacement. Osteoarthritis is a degenerative disease, and it's not going to get better, unfortunately. Um, there have been better outcomes reported in patients who proceeded with a total joint surgery earlier in the disease process than those that waited two years. So um, patients who had surgery sooner uh, had improved function and reduced pain than those who choose to wait. It used to be that it was wait as long as you can, wait as long as you can put up with it, um, don't have surgery until the last possible choice, um, and that's sort of gone by the wayside a little bit. We do have much better performing implants, um, much better uh, performing uh, surgeries uh, and so easier to recover from the surgeries. And so uh, we don't want patients to come and immediately get a joint replacement at the first sign of pain. Uh, we want to go through all those other non-operative measures that we discussed earlier. We want to try to do it at the right time. So we don't want to make you suffer, um, but we also uh, don't want to jump straight to joint replacement if we don't have to. There are new opportunities in arthroplasty or joint replacement, um, improvements in the hip and knee materials, success rates of greater than 90% at uh, 20 years and even improving on to 30 years, uh, partial versus total knee replacements, minimally invasive procedures and techniques, and new designs and technology that allow us to try to give patients the best outcomes that we can. So starting off, what is MAKO? Um, it is a uh, robotic arm system. It is computer navigated, robotic arm assisted. And as you can see, the surgeon is right there uh, holding on to the uh, robotic arm the whole time. We are not off in another room having coffee. We are not taking a break. Um, we are very involved and hands-on in the surgery. Um, this is just guiding us to make it better. This started in 2006 in Florida. Um, the place where I did my fellowship uh, was the second place in the country to do this with Dr. Thomas Kuhn. Um, and initially started with partial knee replacements. So the idea was that if there was damage to just one portion of the knee, uh, you treated it more like a cavity in a tooth. Uh, rather than doing a crown, you would just go ahead and fill that cavity. Um, so it's predominantly on the medial side or inside of the knee, uh, but it can also be done on the outside or lateral part of the knee. Uh, the idea is if there's damage isolated to that single compartment, you just replace that single compartment on the medial or inside part of the knee. Um, similar to just under the kneecap, so this can just be isolated to the patellofemoral joint, so the kneecap and then the, the top portion of the femur. Um, these type of replacements are actually the ones with the fewest restrictions after the surgery uh, because it's not the weight-bearing uh, surface of the joint. Um, I do allow these patients to return to full activity after the, the procedure. Um, and there are some patients who, have, who are younger or who have uh, very isolated disease to two out of the three compartments. Um, and so what we can do there is actually a combination of the two um, to try to preserve as much bone and ligaments as we can. It's very rare that this uh, comes up um, and occurs, but it is a possibility as we look at younger patients who may want to maintain high levels of activity. 
So as you go through this makeoplasty uh, procedure, um, the patient needs to have the correct indications for the actual procedure. So you need to have the disease isolated to the single part of the joint. Um, a CT scan is then performed to make a 3D model of the patient's knee. So you can see we run through and trace all these slides and actually create a virtual image and a virtual model of that exact knee. Um, we can then plan for the placement of the components. We're able to plan with, to a tenth of a degree or a tenth of a millimeter. So very uh, accurate planning of our procedure. And this is all before the patient's in the operating room um, or wanted to proceed with the procedure. Uh, we then do place a couple pins in the thigh bone and shin bone uh, so that we can track those bones as they move through space. Uh, we find the center of the hip, taking the leg through a range of motion. Um, we then map out the knee in space um, with these optical trackers so we can actually tell the robotic uh, computer system uh, where that knee is in space. And so we do this to map it out and then confirm our registration. So now our CT scan uh, and our preoperative plan is combined with our patient's real knee. We can take the knee through a range of motion after we do this and really kind of fine tune our plan so we can actually see the results of our surgery before we commit to any portion of our surgery. So after we have obtained these landmarks, we can optimize our implant tracking. Uh, we can actually map the cartilage so we can have a nice smooth transition from implant to cartilage. Um, we can balance the joint throughout the range of motion. Um, it's an infinitely personalized process. There are eight different sizes of implants. I can take whichever one that best fits that patient and fit it to exactly where it needs to fit for that particular patient. Uh, so it allows us to be very accurate and very consistent um, with a very reproducible uh, process for a surgery that with manual instrumentation is uh, actually a very difficult procedure. And so we can do this with these partial knees to get patients uh, back uh, to action with a little easier recovery and a little less pain, um, but still have good long-term function. Once our plan is set, we actually burr away the bone uh, in the uh, knee joint. Um, it's done through a minimal incision for less tissue damage, uh, but it still needs to be large enough to accommodate the, the metal parts that we're going to put in. Uh, this system creates a safety zone, so a high-speed burr is then used to make these uh, cuts on the femur and tibia. Um, we get feedback as we enter into this room, this green and sort of yellow hatched area that you see. If we're not in that room, the robotic arm won't turn on. Uh, once we enter that room, we can turn the robotic arm on, and then we just try to remove the bone as you see from the screen, and so this is actually taking bone from the patient in the exact time, then real-time tracking of where that bone's disappearing from, from our plan, and we can see that. It doesn't allow us to go outside the lines, so we can't cut things we don't want to, um, including soft tissue, so it allows this procedure to be very safe. So we remove this bone, uh, replace that with uh, the metal uh, portion, and this is what that looks like on x-ray. So on the left-hand side, the arthritis on the inside of the knee, and then on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see we've replaced that uh, with a new metal and plastic bearing surface to get rid of that bone-on-bone -bone pain. So it's a, a less invasive, very accurate, very reproducible bone-conserving option uh, that can be done on the inside of the knee, the outside of the knee, just under the kneecap, or a combination of inside of the knee and under the kneecap. So a very personalized procedure um, that allows for very good patient satisfaction. So they compared excellent um, knee society scores um, for uh, patients with the MAKO UKA, uh, the partial knee, and the uh, manually performed um, partial knee, and the patients with excellent satisfaction scores uh, were almost twice uh, in, a manual, or in the robotic arm assisted as compared to the manual uh, partial knee replacement. Level one randomized control trial uh, out of Scotland. Overall, patient satisfaction does uh, seem to be very good in these patients. Nothing is perfect, so there is a small number of patients that are dissatisfied at both two and five years. But overall, 70 plus percent very satisfied, uh, almost 90 percent uh, patients satisfied. Uh, that gives patients who are very happy with the outcomes of their surgery, um, which is difficult to do uh, with manual instrumentation. We've also decreased the number of revisions that happen at two years. So when this is done with manual instrumentation, it's a little bit of a futsy procedure. Uh, it does take a lot of skill and repetition to get this consistent. And so we've decreased that by 75% uh, from almost 5% uh, revision rate at two years to just over 1% revision rate at two years. So very decrease uh, in cost overall to the system uh, by not having to uh, have those potential revisions that are done. Uh, that study was done with my uh, mentor, Dr. Kuhn, uh, out in California uh, at a multi-center uh, study. So this, that was 2006 and it's progressed uh, from there. Uh, we added the robotic total knee, uh, Mako total knee in uh, four years ago. Um, we're coming up on our four year anniversary of doing this in our facility here. Uh, we were one of the first sites in the country uh, to proceed with uh, the Mako robotic arm total knee replacement. 
And in a total knee, instead of just selectively uh, finding a compartment of the joint to replace, we replace the entire ends of the thigh bone and shin bone, um, cover those with metal and put a plastic liner in between. Um, we'll then often put a plastic button on the undersurface of the kneecap so that we have that entire joint resurfaced um, and ready to, uh, to reduce that patient's pain. So again, this should be familiar. This is the uh, patient with no arthritis in their knee joint, very healthy appearing starts to wear out over time, exposes that bone underneath, causes pain and discomfort, keeps the patient up at night, starts to get them to avoid activities that they want to do. And so then we replace that inside of there. So we're not cutting uh, the ends of the bone off and sticking giant uh, components in there. Um, we're just sort of trimming off and resurfacing the ends of the bones um, and sticking this piece of plastic uh, in between. So here's what this looks like on x-ray. Again, very normal, healthy appearing knee on the left, uh, arthritis and bone on bone on the right-hand side of the screen. And so then we replace the ends of those bones with uh, metal and plastic uh, so that we can try to get that patient's pain and discomfort under control. This is usually done with manual instrumentation, but there can be some variability of manual instrumentation. So this is where they stick a big rod down the thigh, they actually make these cuts through jigs, uh, measure with these uh, devices, and it's, it's good. It's not, not actually bad to do that, um, but it's better you know, there's still something left to be desired with this. So uh, we have a gap um, and an opportunity to improve. So we have survivorship with manual instrumentation of 99% at 10 years. Um, but our patient satisfaction, if you look nationwide, is about 81%. So that's an 18% gap of patients who have needs that they're not happy with. Um, and so we're trying to move and improve uh, that subset of patients to try to get more patients satisfied with their joint replacement, specifically their knee replacement. So the way that we want to do this and how we do this with the make a robotic arm uh, is similar to with the partial knee. So we actually get this CT scan. We can size precisely uh, the, the components and where they need to fit, make sure that we're not sticking in components that are too large or too small. Um, we know exactly the size that we're going to proceed with. Um, this is where we put those arrays in place so we can track those bones in space. We then go through a registration process so that we can register that patient's bone to then combine with the uh, patient's CT scan and the computer navigation to give us real-time feedback and information. So we're not committed to anything as far as size or position uh, of the components from our preoperative plan. We can make intraoperative adjustments based on our ligament balancing. And this is the real key and the real benefit with this uh, robotic arm system. The CT planning is nice and it gives us lots of information there. And the robotic arm section that we'll talk about in a second and making us precise and accurate cuts is very helpful. But really having this information that with very objective numbers that you can look at and see, we're basically seeing the end results of our surgery before we perform it, before we commit to anything with our bone cuts. And so we can make small adjustments to these patients um, to try to optimize their joint balance and both flexion and extension uh, to try to optimize their outcome um, with the surgery. So once we are satisfied with our intraoperative adjustments and plan and we have balanced flexion and extension gaps to the area that we want, uh, we then proceed with that robotic arm-assisted bone resection. So again, big view of what this looks like on the screen. Um, I actually had a lady this week who asked me if she got a green knee replacement, and I said, no, it's still silver. Um, but you can see where she would think that. She'd come in, this is on the screen. Um, that area of green is where that replacement's going to go, and then you can see where the bone is going to be cut around there, and we can size and make sure that we're putting the right sizes on here. We get a lot of information to make sure we're making um, accurate cuts and um, things that are going to last a long time by putting them in as close to mechanical axis as we can. Um, so we're trying to make durable uh, procedure uh, that's very predictable. Again, this is where we put those arrays in place, um, do this registration for our CT guided uh, bone registration. So the smaller dots are dots where we give the information from the bone so it can match up and mask onto the CT scan. And then the bigger blue dots are where we go and confirm our registration. So there's a lot of safety involved uh, to make sure that we're performing the procedure that we want on the patient that we want, on the bone that we want. So uh, make sure that we're not going to make any mistakes uh, as far as the execution of that surgery and, and the precision that is involved. And then this is our dynamic pre-resection balancing. So these numbers 18, that's the amount of implant that we're going to replace into the bone. So we want to make sure there's enough space to fit those in there. So sometimes when we do this, we end up with asymmetric gaps. So say one is 14 and one is 19. And so we want to try to get those balanced and do that. And this gives us a lot of ability to do that. We can do that with some soft tissue releases to try to get the leg to come straighter if we need to. We can do that by manipulating the implants virtually to try to create that space that we need uh, in extension or in flexion. Um, and so once we have these gaps balanced, um, that gives a nice, smooth, uh, stable range of motion throughout the arc from extension into flexion. 
The goal then being that patients don't have areas that are tight, areas that are loose, um, and so the patients have a better feeling knee at the end. That's the goal that we're looking for. Uh, once we're happy with our plan and we have these uh, gaps that are balanced, um, we then proceed with our bone cuts. So um, this again, robotic arm gives us a level of safety, so it won't let us cut things that we don't want to cut. Um, so we just are going to cut the area of bone we need to to replace with that metal implant, um, but it's protecting the soft tissue as well. So it won't let us cut outside those areas uh, where there's some soft tissue around there. Increased level of safety and precision. Um, there's actually studies showing that these cuts are more accurate than with the manual instrumentation jigs that you briefly saw as we were starting to talk about knee replacement. And then this creates a safety area. So there are very big structures back in the back of the knee uh, that we don't want to cut. And so this allows us to prevent from going into that. Um, so it allows us a level of safety that we can't get with manual instrumentation and really that you can't get unless the robotic arm is helping with the saw. So this is the uh, main system uh, where you can actually follow your cuts uh, through and know where you're at um, so that you can avoid any of the soft tissue uh, that you don't want to cut. Early clinical results are good. So this was a study out of uh, England uh, comparing 30 patients who had had, or sorry, 40 patients uh, who had had a conventional uh, jig arthroplasty, uh, manual arthroplasty with a robotic arm assisted arthroplasty. So um, they found that these patients, uh, there was a little bit more time in the operating room, uh, but they had less blood loss. Um, they had uh, less pain after the surgery and rather significantly less pain from a pain scale of five out of 10 to three compared to three out of 10. Um, and then the next day from 6 out of 10 to 3.6 out of 10. So definitely an improvement as far as pain goes. Um, when I was in California in training, we used to give patients 240 pills of pain meds um, for their surgery, and now we give them 40. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's refills that need to be happening from time to time, but most patients do very well um, with a much smaller amount of narcotics, um, which is very helpful. And that goes back to sort of the minimally invasive uh, total knee uh, theory uh, and uh, idea that we came, that we worked with, and that was part of my big part of my training uh, at the Kuhn Joint Replacement Institute. So Dr. Thomas Kuhn uh, helped to come up and invent uh, minimally invasive total knee about 20 years ago, with the goal to provide early and exceptional analgesia, uh, a low trauma surgery, and then early discharge and rapid rehabilitation. 20, 25 years ago, patients spent 10 to 14 days in the hospital after joint replacements. Um, now we've shortened that down to um, an overnight stay, uh, often going home the same day. Um, and so we've really sort of decreased the amount of time and resources that it takes uh, to recover from this uh, joint replacement surgery. And the goal is to prevent the bad effects of the surgery uh, initially. So we do some preemptive analgesia with the spinal anesthetic, some Celebrex even the night before surgery and the morning of surgery. We want to prevent the, the nausea or upset stomach, a little Pepsi to, to help calm that from the surgery. And then, you know, sort of do an injection around the joint, that spinal anesthetic and some IV sedation so you don't have to be awake for the surgery while we do this. Get patients up, working with physical therapy the same day, working on range of motion the same day. Um, patients getting up and moving. Um, do some formal gait training, stairs, physical therapy sees patients on the day of surgery. Um, and more and more patients, as I said, are heading to do this as outpatient. If you're not ready to do this as the same day surgery and go home the same day, you don't have to. Obviously, not everyone's going to be ready for that. And so we have options of staying overnight. Um, but then we have excellent physical therapists that work with the patients and an excellent team that helps give you as good a care as, as we can provide. Um, now we'll move on to hips and what a hip replacement uh, looks like and hip arthroplasty. Initial sort of conversation about hip arthroplasty starts with the bearing surface. So it's important uh, for the durability and longevity of the implant. Uh, there's a ball on the cup um, that are gliding in there. And so we want to make sure that that has a long lasting option. Um, I use a ceramic on plastic uh, option. So that uh, is a very long, durable, long lasting, durable construct um, that doesn't have that has fewer side effects. So it doesn't have squeaking that can happen with it. It doesn't have metal on metal complications that can occur. Um, metal on plastic is another option, but there can be um, what's called trunnionosis or some irritation between the cobalt chrome femoral head and the titanium femoral stem uh, that can cause some metal ion issues. This was uh, brought to light uh, six months ago before my last talk here um, on Gray's Anatomy, uh, where one of the senior physicians um, had had a metal on metal hip replacement. And as he was slowly going into uh, what they thought was dementia or rapid onset Alzheimer's, um, they found it was uh, from metal ion poisoning from his hip replacement. So now you can actually learn something from Gray's Anatomy. Um, moving on to minimally invasive and how we can combine this with the hip replacement and the durable um, bearing surface, uh, moving on to a gentle soft tissue approach to put that component in. So what is the direct anterior approach to the hip? 
Um, it's a minimally invasive hip replacement technique that allows the surgeon good access to the hip without detaching any muscles or tendons. So it allows us to be able to spread between muscles rather than cut them, uh, access to the joint without having to disrupt any of those tendons or muscles, uh, which leaves things more normal. So traditional hip replacement can be an 8 to 12 inch incision on the side uh, or back side of the hip and you have to cut through the what's called short external rotators and the IT band. So there's a big stretch of tissue that you have to cut in order to get any access to the joint from anything other than a direct anterior approach. Um, Direct anteriors can be a smaller incision. There can be small incision posterior approach total hips, um, but when you go from the front, it allows us to spread between those muscles and not cut or detach those muscles or tendons. Um, why do I do it this way uh, for this direct anterior approach? Uh, the hip is actually closer to the front of the body. So as you look at this diagram, uh, the hip joint's sort of in the groin area. Um, it's a surgical anatomy, so it's an internervous plane. It's an intramuscular plane. We don't have to detach any major muscles. There's minimal risk to nerves, so it's truly a minimally invasive uh, surgery. Um, as with any surgery, there are nerves and vessels in the area, and we take care to avoid them. Um, but as you sort of become accomplished with this uh, approach, um, those risks become very small. This is where they make this approach on the posterior side. That big white band is that IT band. As you can imagine, you have to cut through that. Um, there can be less pain with an anterior approach, a little quicker restoration of function, uh, shorter hospital stay, and probably more economical with less utilization of resources after the surgery. Um, patients have less need for physical therapy after the surgery in the outpatient setting. Um, and so there's some benefit potentially from that. Um, I think it's an ideal soft tissue interval. Um, it gives us ease of patient position um, and a simple socket instrumentation. Um, you are placed into this odd contraption you see on the left, um, but that just acts as our assistant that allows us to move the leg in space and give us consistent um, information that we can use for our surgery. Why doesn't everybody do it this way? It can be unfamiliar territory and it does take a while and there's a fairly steep learning curve. The exposure of the thigh bone or femoral bone is difficult and it does take a little bit of specialized equipment. So um, once you become familiar with this, it does take 50 to 60 cases to, to get through the learning curve. And while you're going through that learning curve, there can be some complications that can occur. Um, as we get into the thousands of cases, those complications become incredibly rare. Um, and luckily that's where we're at at this point um, for, for my experience level. How it's done and what that specifically looks like. These are some of the special instruments on the right-hand side. I'm unfamiliar with how to use the ones on the left-hand side. Um, so just a little bit longer retractors, a little specific uh, instruments that we use in order to just sort of navigate the, the hip joint from the front. Um, we do use a light uh, on our head to sort of be able to see into this hole. And then this is that table in use, and you can see it allows us to have an assistant that doesn't ask for a bathroom break, doesn't ask for a raise, uh, doesn't say that it's hungry, um, it doesn't complain. So we just kind of move this arm in place, and that allows us to expose the, the hip joint and proceed with the surgery. There's a video here, head on the right-hand side of the screen, foot of the left. This is the interval that we're looking for, so we make this incision sort of by the front pocket. Then we then approach and spread between those muscles. Um, you can see that there are nerves in the area, um, but we avoid them and, and try to keep them out of the way. There's a vessel that we coagulate on our way in. Um, we know where it's at. We identify it um, and coagulate this at, at every time so we have minimal bleeding as we proceed through the procedure. We expose the joint capsule at the front of the joint, uh, place in our retractors so that we can see the front portion of the, the femoral neck and then uh, continue with our exposure here. I know it's around dinner time, so hopefully this cartoon isn't too um, bloody or grotesque as we move through here. Um, we open up the joint capsule to give us access to the joint. So once we've identified the joint and can see this ball and socket joint in place, um, we actually, you know, I learned this in Napa Valley, so we take the wine uh, cork remover and put that on the femoral head make our uh, femoral neck cut, and then we can remove that uh, femoral head uh, from inside the socket. So this is referred to as disarticulating the hip, so we, we remove that out of the way, um, taking care not to damage any soft tissue as we do this. Um, we then expose the cup or the acetabulum uh, with a couple of retractors, um, and then find a little cheese grater device that we use to freshen up the bone um, and get rid of the hard sclerotic bone um, that's there from the arthritis and expose some bleeding bone underneath. Uh, place this metal cup uh, that the bone grows onto uh, with a plastic liner that we use as our bearing surface. Uh, very durable, uh, very long-lasting, low wear rate on that plastic liner. 
Um, and then this is the difficult part. This is how we expose this thigh bone or femur. Uh, so we want to, that arm that you saw or that device, the table that we use, allows us to twist the leg in a position so that we can access this consistently. Uh, we place our retractor so that we can see the proximal end of the thigh bone. Uh, we take off a little bit of the capsule um, so that we can deliver the proximal end of the femur into the incision so that we can access the femoral canal. Um, and we want to prep this so that we're uh, nice and safe uh, with our trial components. So we do a series of, these are called brooches, um, to find the correct size uh, for the correct patient. Um, and then we can go through a trial reduction process. So um, we go ahead and build in um, our trial uh, femoral component using these separate pieces um, and then place a uh, plastic ball uh, to allow us to test the stability of the joint um, and make sure that we like our stability and our leg length. Um, and we can take actually an x-ray after we get everything put back together and so we can compare that to our preoperative uh, evaluation. So now we need to go ahead and be able to bring the, the ball back down uh, to deliver into the patient's uh, cup here. Um, we actually don't even use that uh, hook that you see anymore. Um, so we are able to swing that leg back up. They're going to change the view here in a second. And these are the soft tissue that we don't have to cut from the anterior approach. So all those uh, muscles that are attaching onto that thigh bone are still in place. And so that gives us more stability and less risk for dislocation after the surgery. So uh, we then put that ball and cut back together. Um, and now you can proceed with performing your own hip replacement uh, in your garage. So there are precautions with hip replacement uh, so that you don't dislocate the hip because there is a level of instability after the surgery. With more traditional posterior approach hip replacement, they don't want you to cross your legs or bend your hip more than 90 degrees. Uh, they don't want you to turn your toes in. Um, and often you have to sleep with a pillow between your legs uh, for four to six weeks after the surgery. With the anterior approach, we have very minimal restrictions. We just don't want you to turn your foot all the way out to the side and bring it all the way back behind you, uh, which is a very odd position to find yourself in. Uh, mainly, eventually you want to avoid the warrior two pros in yoga um, is what we have learned. Um, but otherwise, if you don't have those traditional restrictions as far as hip replacement, there's no restrictions on sleeping or um, going to the bathroom or anything like that. Potential benefits with this minimally invasive surgery anterior approach, um, decreased hospital stay, quicker rehabilitation, smaller incision, less muscle disruption, so it's a more normal feeling, more native uh, feeling joint, um, shorter recovery time and less scarring. Uh, there seems to be less blood loss, less time in surgery, um, and reduced post-operative pain. Often patients will just take Tylenol after the surgery, although we do give them a short prescription of uh, narcotics just in case. Um, and then the risk of dislocation is reduced, and so there's less risk of dislocating that hip with an anterior approach as opposed to a posterior approach. Um, all that may allow for a quicker return to natural uh, function and activity, um, and so patients can get back to their lives and what they want to do. Uh, I think it's better for the patients. I think there's fewer to no uh, hip precautions um, and improved control over those components and the position that we put them in. Um, now we've talked about this technology and uh, the knee replacement. Uh, when I was in California is when we started using the robotic arm technology and hip replacement. Um, with navigation and robotic assist, the goal to give an increased level of precision. So hip replacements in general are very forgiving uh, of slight um, inaccuracies uh, in the procedure, um, but you don't want to have a huge outlier. You don't want to put something uh, in somebody that doesn't last for a long period of time. So this uh, navigation with our computer uh, and robotic arm assist gives us confidence in our component position uh, because the recovery room is too late to make any changes. So we don't want to have to bring you back. Our goal is to optimize our surgical results. So when we're doing this with manual instrumentation, we're doing two-dimensional imaging from manual total hips, templating off of a plain x-ray as opposed to a three-dimensional uh, CT scan. So we get that same CT scan, make that 3D model of the hip joint, um, and so we can actually figure out exactly in space and three dimensions and actually scroll through our CT scan um, for better preoperative planning, uh, which gives us information to perform a better surgery. This uh, was a study comparing um, patients from Massachusetts General Hospital, which is a very well-renowned um, center of excellence in hip replacement, um, comparing their scatter plot on the left-hand side uh, to a, the robotic arm assisted surgery on the right-hand side. So on the left-hand side, this is almost 2,000 patients. Um, the scatter plot, the goal of that and the, the target is actually inside that box. And so 50% of those dots are inside the box and 50% are outside the box. So the accuracy of the position of those components uh, was almost like flipping a coin. Uh, moving to the robotic arm assisted, 96% were inside the target zone um, and 95% were within four degrees of the plan. So very accurate uh, for our execution of plan for the hip replacement and less chance for uh, outliers um, and complications. 
This was confirmed in multiple different studies uh, showing that the safe position for the component uh, was much more accurate in robotic arm assisted as opposed to conventional hip replacement. So goals of a hip replacement are always the same. So we want to have pain relief from that hip joint. Uh, we want to restore your function and lifestyle. Uh, we want it to be a stable joint. Um, and then we want uh, the third level is to, to match those leg lengths up as best we can. Um, all that's to optimize our patient outcomes and have happy patients um, and do it in the most economical way that we can. So um, even in a pandemic, economics are an important part of healthcare. And so we don't want to do things that, that cost too much. So um, again, we want to take some of this information that we had from the knees and apply it to the hips as far as minimally invasive techniques. Um, start with our early and exceptional analgesia, uh, provide that low trauma surgery where we're not damaging uh, muscles or tendons unnecessarily, um, and then get patients again up and moving for rapid rehabilitation. So again, with the spinal anesthetic and the, the preoperative uh, medications to help prevent the bad effects from our surgery. We do that with the IV sedation so patients don't have to be awake for the surgery and then we do inject around the joint uh, to help with pain after the surgery. Um, so we can have patients who go from a, a horrible hip uh, to a new hip replaced, get them up, get them moving, uh, get patients up and walking the same day and potentially even home the same day. So uh, Medicare uh, and all insurances have now taken hip and knee replacement off of the inpatient only list. Um, and so uh, all patients who are medically able um, and desire to do so could be eligible if they hit the criteria to, to go home safely the same day. Um, although we do have the uh, safety at the hospital for staying overnight um, if patients need that and we would feel more comfortable with that. This is actually the first uh, patient who's hit by replaced in Boulder almost eight years ago now. Um, he put on 10,000 miles uh, in 18 months after his hip replacement. Um, he's a very active 82 year old at that point in time. Um, on the left is him cresting uh, Teton Pass uh, four months after surgery and then had doing a century ride uh, five months after surgery. Uh, very active, very nice guy. Uh, much more miles on his bike than I do for sure. So. Um, in summary, uh, robotic arm total hip replacement is more accurate than uh, manually instrumented total hip replacement. Uh, the improved accuracy helps for clinical outcomes, so lower dislocation rate, less leg length discrepancy, less blood loss, and then excellent patient reported outcomes, so better Harris hip scores and activity scores than the manual total hip replacements. Um, with the robotic arm assisted uh, total hip, there can be a little bit more time in the operating room, although that did not cause any increase in infections or any increase in complications. Um, and then reeking, looking through the cost benefit analysis and trying to make sure this is economic requires sort of longer term and more in-depth studies um, that have been done at this time. With surgery, there are always risks. Um, and so these risks are bleeding, infection, you know, damage to nerves and vessels, need for further surgery risk of blood clots, blood clots go into lungs, rare things like stroke, heart attack, and death. So obviously we try to prevent these. They're very rare complications, but they can occur. And in addition with hip replacement, there are risks of dislocation, um, breaking of the bone anytime you do surgery on a bone. Um, and then uh, leg length discrepancy is, is one of the risks as well. Uh, you can't have a talk uh, about healthcare in 2020 without bringing up COVID. Um, our current COVID protocol uh, at Boulder Community Health has been very strong. Uh, we have been performing elective surgeries since the late April, uh, early May of 2020. Um, there are no current plans to stop um, that process, but always we're keeping tabs and our excellent infectious disease and sort of public health uh, is keeping us up to date on our availability to proceed. Um, but at this time, there are no plans to stop, but well, that may change. Um, every patient gets a COVID test um, before the surgery and all staff uh, follow the proper uh, PPE protocols uh, that we have in place um, recommended by the CDC. So um, we have proceeded, uh, patients have done very well. Um, it has actually been a, a very busy period from April until now. Um, and so I think we're doing well at, at making sure patients have a safe experience in this uh, pandemic uh, time. So thank you for your time uh, on this Monday night. And if you have questions, um, we can go ahead and start with some of those. Thank you, Dr. Blackwood. Um, we just have a few questions for this evening and then we can um, get on oh, done. Um, is this uh, covered by Medicare? Is 
That's a good question. So is, is this uh, procedures and the robotic arm assistance covered by Medicare and other insurances? Um, so yes, it is just uh, billed as a joint replacement. Um, there are certain robotic codes that you may see um, and your insurance company may or may not pay for those, um, but you will not be held liable for those if the insurance company does not pay for them. Um, and the only potential added cost is a CT scan um, in order to get that plan um, before the surgery, um, but this should be covered by insurance uh, and Medicare. This next question comes from a 58-year-old um, lifetime runner who needs a left knee replacement. Um, he, he said he went and saw the doctors and they told him he needs a left knee replacement but no more running after the replacement. Um, are there other options? Uh, so that's a good question. So are there other options or, or options if you have a knee replacement? So obviously we want to make sure that you, if you want to run and keep that activity up, um, make sure that you've exhausted all the non-operative measures. So the anti-inflammatories, the injections, um, those types of activities. Um, if the joint has worn out to that point um, and you need to proceed with joint replacement or there's really no other options, running is kind of frowned upon uh, sort of long term. We do have newer implantation techniques and newer um, devices that the bone actually grows onto. And so our main worry with running uh, previously has been to disrupt the cement mantle of when we used to cement the knee replacements in place. And we still do that on occasion um, to cement the metal parts onto the bone. Um, in theory, uh, patients should be able to be more active with the biologic fixation um, on there, but it still could offer some wear and increased wear on the plastic in between the metal parts. Um, what I tell patients is I explain the risks, tell them I do not recommend, you know, running marathons or, or, you know, running, but if someone's chasing you run away, um, you know, jumping off of, you know, higher levels or jumping off of a truck bed, it's not a great idea, but if a car's coming, jump out of the way. Um, and then you're an adult, we're doing your surgery. I tell you the risks. I'm not going to follow you around. You can do with it what you want, um, but understand that it may wear out faster, um, than if you didn't do that. So, um, I hope that answers the, the question. Um, what are your thoughts on CBD and THC creams? What are my thoughts on CBD and THC creams? So, uh, good question in Boulder and Colorado uh, specifically. Um, I do not have an official position on that um, because I'm not really allowed to um, based on legalities with federal level and, and I haven't taken the special uh, THC course for medical marijuana type stuff. Um, in general, I think they're off the, you know, less specific or, you know, not my specific official position. Um, there may be some benefit from that. Um, I definitely have had patients where I've told them to pick and op pick between the two, opioids or THC, um, and patients will quickly try to move over to the, the THC from the opioids. Um, we actually did have a patient last week um, who could not really tolerate opioids and was had set up for CBD and THC. I have a lot of patients who, before surgery, are, are trying the CBD and THC. We have cannabinoid receptors in our bodies for a reason, so we evolved with this uh, plant, um, and I think there, there is some potential benefit probably with the CBD portion, but there may be some benefit with pain relief with the THC portion. Um, but I think we, we're on the verge of getting some information because of how local laws have changed and being able to actually do and perform these studies. Um, so hopefully there becomes an answer to that question. And so here I can say it's similar to over-the-counter medicines and you can you know try that. Um, and I do think it has, again, potential benefit, um, but I'd, my official position is I, I can't prescribe it. So. Great. And we're just going to end on one more question. Um, can you explain what a baker cyst is and how it can be treated? That's good. So um, a baker cyst is a collection of fluid um, that forms in the back of the knee. It's a little pocket or outpooching from the joint capsule. Um, when that forms, it can cause some pain or fullness in the back of the knee. They're very difficult and very frustrating to deal with. So um, before the cause of the fluid is removed, um, you can try to draw the fluid out, but it often comes back. Sometimes you can inject the knee with cortisone and it can reduce it for a period of time. Um, but what often needs to happen is the, the joint gets replaced. We don't necessarily directly address the Baker cyst, but we turn off the faucet. So we stop the fluid from accumulating and then that cyst resolves on its own. It may not, there is a subset of patients where the cyst persists, but as long as they're not having swelling, then that aspiration and injection option becomes a little bit better at about a year after surgery if that Baker cyst hasn't resolved on its own.
And we've come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org slash livestream. You will, be, we will, you will receive a post-lecture survey by email tomorrow. Please take a minute to fill this out, and thank you for joining us this evening. Have a great day.